All right, everybody, this is Ross the Fig Boss. Uh, in today's video, we have a really exciting interview. I'm here with my friend, Dan Foster. Uh, Dan is a grower that uh, is really into figs, and he has been growing figs uh, pretty much as long or longer than I have. In fact, Dan and I kind of go way back. In fact, uh, when he first started, he was one of the first persons I actually bought fig cuttings from way back on uh, Figs for Fun. And so that's kind of actually how I, I learned about Dan and started talking to Dan is he sold me, I think, a pack of cuttings for like yeah. super cheap. Uh, and I, I was, was like, this box or something like that. Yeah, yeah it was, it was... Like Carter pack. I actually looked at my notes um, before we got on the call because I'm like, you know, I have a, a little a little book that I wrote everybody's name and address down. And I, and I saw your name in there. I'm like, I wonder where he's from. I think it's Pennsylvania. And sure enough, um, just still in pennsylvania right i am still in pennsylvania so yep. langhorn or longhorn or something like that yeah so i'm in i'm in bucks county um and it's just it's funny to like just think about how the every like how far you and i have come isn't it like it's just it's just wild like uh yep. and you know to think about even you know how little we knew and um to also think about all the people we've met along the way isn't it crazy how yeah. Many people have been a part of this hobby. They they were into growing figs, and then all of a sudden they're just gone. They're just like disappear. And so there's there's not many people like you and I, uh, at least in the United States, that you know I've been doing this for as long as we have, and and in a part of this hobby, um, which is why I really like Dan, because he's not just some guy that's going to be in this for two seconds and disappear. You know. Um, He's in it because he really loves figs, and that's like, you know, that's the most important part. And uh, so if you really love figs, you're going to be here too. And so when I hear Dan speak or talk about whether it's in his videos, by the way, Dan has a, a YouTube channel. We'll link that down in the description. I think it's just called Dan Foster, right? Yeah. Yep. And so when I hear Dan speak or even write on different forums, or I, what I love to do actually is see Dan's Facebook page because he usually uploads an album of photos that every year he takes a photo and, you know, has the name of the fig, the date, and he's got beautiful plates. He's, he's the beautiful plate guy for anyone that doesn't know. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> and so I always, I just always love to hear what Dan has to say, because again, he, he's been around the block. He's seen everything that you could see. Uh, and he's still here. You know, he's not one of these loudmouth people that comes in, says their piece, and then it dips and is just no longer here anymore. He's here for the right reasons. Um, so, yeah, that's that's Dan Foster in a nutshell, I think, right there. Um, yeah, thank you. So, Dan, if you if you want, we can start off by, why don't you say a little bit about yourself and, and growing figs in Michigan and maybe how you got started and, and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah, so I think it was, I think it was back in um, – I can't even remember how long ago it was, um, uh, 12, 4, 12, 13 years ago or so. Um, I had, uh, for work, I had went to Amsterdam on a trip to um, visit Horta Fair, which is it's a large greenhouse trade show um, where they get into automation and things like that. But uh, kind of on a side trip, I went to a, a farmer's market and I picked up some figs. Um, I had never seen a fig before. Um, and tried a few of them and I was like blown away by them because I had never seen a fig or had a fig before. It just blew me away. So when I got back home for Christmas, um, my, um, my ex-wife, um, then uh, my wife then got me some figs on from a website. Uh, one of the, one of the, uh, I think it was a Willis nursery or one of those, uh, pretty common nurseries. Uh, three bare root figs, you know, a brown turkey, a Celeste, and an Italian Everberry. And I was like, um, that was so cool. So that kind of right there, that started it. Um, one of them was dead right out of the box, or, you know, it was, they were bare root. So they were kind of dry. One of them was pretty dried up. Um, the other two I, I got to survive. And, um, yeah, shortly after that, uh, I met Raf Ed. Um, uh, there's quite a few people in the Detroit area. Uh, Raf Ed actually was just at my house yesterday. Um, he's not too active in the fig um, world right now, 
Um, but he actually came to the house to pick some pawpaws with me. So I sent him home with a big box of pawpaws. But um, kind of like what you're saying, there, there's I've met a lot of people in this hobby, a lot of people um, along the way. A lot of them are, are still really good friends. Um, but um, it's been an interesting journey. Um, I give away a lot of figs in the fall. So um, I started off with those three figs. And then when I met Rafed, I went to Rafed's house and he just loaded me up. He, he's like, you got this one, you got this one. And he just starts handing me figs. So I go home with 15 or 20 new figs, not, not even having a, really a clue what I got myself into. And so, you know, then, you know, 20 figs turns into 50 figs, turns into 75 figs. At the height, I probably had around 135 figs at one time, which, you know, it's, it's a good collection, but it's not, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have that many figs. Um, but I really tried to, um, you know, when you're, when you're in Michigan, it's quite a bit different than being somewhere in California where you can plant this stuff outside and forget about it, you know? Um, like Harvey's got his orchard of, you know, 500 or plus trees, you know, you can pretty much set them and forget them. And, um, you can't do that in Michigan. you got to pace yourself. you got to think about the space. you got to think about where you're going to store these, how much work you got yourself, um, into in the fall when you've got to put these things away. Um, so I really kind of told myself, let's try to stay at a hundred. If that means you got to get rid of 25 every year. That's what you got to do. If you're going to get more, you got to get rid of something. So every year, I really I I go around. I start in uh, August, September, and I and I cut myself up 25 ribbons, and I just start putting the ribbons on the plants that they split, or when the rain comes, the bug gets them, or they don't taste good, or they're duplicates, or they're synonyms. And so that's kind of what I do is like every year um, uh, when the frost hits, um, I'm yanking them out of the ground. I, I kind of vary the pots in the ground a little bit, just enough to the, where the roots can search for some nutrients and some water. Not a lot, but um, and yeah, and it, I give I give about 25 trees away. Um, I've made a lot of I call them big crazy people around uh, in the you know, CJ, one of my one of my good friends, CJ, he's kind of slowing down. I think on the fig craze a little bit. Um, he's got a lot going on with the church and everything. Um, but he was one of the first people that I loaded up. You know, he he brought his van, and when he left my driveway, he could barely get out of the driveway because the tires were rubbing on the axles. And um, I've had a lot of people that have come and picked up figs, and that to me is one of the most um, enjoyable parts of this is you know, spreading the fig love around. I mean, I do sell cuttings, I do sell plants, but I give away a lot also. Um, I enjoy that. Um, I, I know there, there's a lot of people that um, they're really grateful to have that first plant, you know. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, Dan, I, I really um, can uh, relate to a lot of what you said. And I think... Uh, to add on to the last point you made is like, you know, I think the people who have stuck around this long are typically the people who have, you know, found a way to to, to enjoy the giving process, you know, because I think uh, giving is something that a lot of people can enjoy, but not everybody, I think, is, you know, so willing or also, you know, uh, understanding of you got to give to get. And I think... Um, you know, there, there's also, I think, this whole thing in my life with just relationships. And so if, um, you know, if people are in a way negatively affecting your life, it's it's like uh, it's not worth it. And so the people who you end up giving a lot of things to end up giving you a lot of things in return. And and so those end up being really the, the people you typically care about the most and the people who care about you the most. Um so it's nice to hear you say all that, and it just it just makes sense. Of course, Dan's been in this for so long. Not only does he love figs, but he's also, you know, he's gaining so much from this in his own life. Uh, now to say a couple things for those who are not really familiar, because Dan, we have a, I got a, not a huge audience, but like an audience that some people don't really know all the names that you just said. 
And so Harvey, uh, Dan was mentioning, Harvey's a, a guy in California who is a commercial chestnut grower, and he actually has a business called Figaholics, and so he sells a lot of fig cuttings, and, and Harvey actually planted a lot of trees to sell cuttings from, and he, he also sells his own fruits uh, at local supermarkets. Yeah. Um, Rafed is a guy that goes way back, just like Harvey, and so when I was on Figs for Fun with Dan, these guys were also a part of Figs for Fun, and uh, Rafed was a guy that uh, a lot of people respected, and he started his own Facebook group called uh, Rafed's Fig Group after uh, Fix for Fun had died and people moved on and created their own little thing. And Rafed is in, you said, the Detroit area. Um, and then CJ Andre is a pastor, and he's also been a longer time fig grower, a more prominent figure in the in the Facebook group communities because, you know, uh, CJ is a very magnetic person, and he has some really amazing trees with uh, – some of the fertilizing and his practices, which I also want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, so why don't we, st- I guess we could start there actually, cause CJ, I got fixated actually. Um, for a while I was really trying to figure out what is it about CJ's trees that make them grow? Is it really the, the fertilizer, you know, is it really um, maybe something else that he does in terms of getting the right form and really not pruning the tree and getting the tree to a a higher height and then topping it and then getting the scaffolds to form. And, you know, and I I came to some conclusions this year, and I hope maybe you can either confirm them or deny them. But it seems like to me that Alaska fish fertilizer is really special stuff because when you have that Alaska fish fertilizer, that really feeds the microbes in the soil. And so the microbes I've learned, and it just all makes sense um, with us as humans as well. We all have our own microbiome. We're covered in we're covered in microbes. We're all made up of microbes, and the soil is no different. And so when I have not just my figs, but if I'm looking at my, you know, food forest sort of area that I've created over the years, and and turned it into a really was a terrible soil into something really spectacular, or at least let's say average, it's been all about the mulch it's been all about the layers of material and every time i cut this and i cut that or i have leaves this i add them to that soil and over time the microbes eat that stuff and so that's kind of just what's happening here with i think the alaska fish fertilizer but on a quicker a quicker sense and so i this year i started making my own compost tea and so i don't know if you know anything dan about compost tea but that's one of the things you feed your tea with is you get this, the really good compost and to feed the microbes, you actually add in some fish fertilizer or fish emulsion. And, you know, it's interesting, Dan, um, I also have been making my own, um, kefir. Do you know what kefir is? Mm-hmm. My wife and I were talking or, about or that. Or kefir. Yeah. So, yep. so there's a, there's a doctor on YouTube that I found and he, his whole thing is about making your own kefir. And you can basically choose different probiotics. One is, in particular, is the L. rudii probiotic. And you can inoculate your kefir, essentially, and add in the milk. When you make the kefir with all the grains, you add in the L. rudii probiotic that you can buy. And then what you do is, in order to not just, because that the L. rudii is the compost, right? It has all the microbes in it. But if you want to feed the microbes and make them grow to a larger amount, you can add uh, prebiotic fiber. So you can add different fibers that exist. And so that is what microbes feed on in our guts, right? When we eat different diversity of fiber, and of course I'm not a doctor, but this is um, very relating, I think, to the soil. So how do you think, what do you think it is about CJ's trees? Do you think it's, you know, is it really a lot of it, the fish fertilizer? Do you think it's, I'm sure it's a combination of things. So what do you, how do you feel about all that? Okay. Well, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big topic. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I, you know, I, I oftentimes tell people, um, I see posts on Facebook. I, I see topics on our figs. Um, a lot of people, they want to know what that secret sauce is. You know, they want to, and, and I often say, if you ask a hundred people what fertilizer is best, you're going to get a hundred different answers. Um, that's the, the 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 truth of it. Um, CJ was his big his big thing was Super Thrive. He loved Super Thrive. Um, so oh, okay. 
I went to Michigan State, and, and I got I do have a degree in horticulture, and I'm not saying that I know everything. Um, but I'm not a huge organic person, right? Um, I feed okay. with inorganic fertilizer. I use uh, a liquid feed, sixteen four sixteen. I get it from work. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't mm-hmm. generally put any microbes in my soil at all, and um, and I don't think CJ did either. Um, did, did, have you? Ever heard him talk about the fish fertilizer? I don't. Think well, I he... knew that he used to hit the turkey baster, and he oh, would yes. inject he would into that. the soil with the. Yeah, he would put the super yeah. thrive right in the soil with the turkey baster, or with a, a big syringe. Oh yeah, he'd have a syringe mm-hmm. and he'd stick that in the soil and juice that soil up with that super thrive, and he swore that that was what and. and to be honest, his plants did grow very well. Um, I did hook them up with a dosatron and a, a drip irrigation system a few years ago. Um, it, it, you know, it's one of those things where you're going to have a hundred and hundred and some trees. Um, you're going to get really tired of it if you have to hand water every single day, twice a day through July and August. So you got to make it easier on yourself. So I, I think. You know, as daunting as it may be, I think everybody, if they're going to grow in pots and they're going to have more than 50 trees, you're going to want to put some sort of a drip irrigation system on it. And if you're going to do that, you might as well put an injector on it also and and use some water-based fertilizer. Um, That doesn't mean that you can't put the fish emulsion in in the microbes um, in the soil as well. Um, It can't hurt. Um, The mycorrhizae, anything that you can add to that soil to help help it um help the roots um uh take up nutrients better um but um you know i i use a dosatron um and and you can you could probably get a dosmatic or a dose what is that a dosatron is a is that the injector yeah it's a metering injector so you generally speaking you have a stock bucket of fertilizer like a five gallon or a 15 gallon bucket of water soluble concentrate and I use a timer mm-hmm. and that timer turns on twice a day for a half an hour water is at seven o'clock in the morning and seven o'clock at night and it puts out about a half a gallon per emitter and so you know um, you can get a lot of those parts at Home Depot or Lowe's um, and um, then I'm then my my plants are getting fertilized every time they're getting watered and then late August, I'll cut that off, and I'll just use clear water. Because I, I really don't, I don't want the plants putting out a lot of fresh growth in September and October. I want them to shut down and start to lignify and go dormant. So, um, if you've got a lot of green growth right now, and a frost comes, you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot of your tips. So, um, so that's that's kind of how I do it. And I, and I because I work at a greenhouse. Um, I can buy fertilizer from my work. Um, it's a it's a proven winter blend, um, but uh, AM Leonard sends uh, they sell um, a peat light special that's very similar. I think it's twenty one mm-hmm. five ten or something like that. Um, I know there's there's been a lot of talk about the the middle number of phosphorus increasing fruit production. I don't know that I buy mm-hmm. into any of that either. I'll be honest with you. Um, I yeah. think if you use a well balanced yeah, fertilizer, um, the plants can only use up so much phosphorus as it is. So, um, you use a well balanced fertilizer that's going to keep your pH neutral or or a little slightly alkaline. That's kind of where you want to be, and it's worked for me. And, you know, and go ahead. You know, Dan, I just want to interrupt you for a sec because it's it's crazy like how often fertilizer comes up as a topic and so for me out of all the things you can do for your fig it's one of the lowest things that i even think about it's not even really in my mind and you said everybody has like the same as a very different answer for the same thing uh and if you pulled 100 growers you know it's it, it's just like if you just stay consistent with it early in the season no matter what it is that you use you're going to see good results um now I do. I'm, I am very interested in the soil microbes, but beyond just the soil and beyond, uh, you know, let's say um, fertilizer, I should say. What do you think, CJ, or you? Because you, even yourself, you have really great trees. I, I know this from seeing them in, in videos and different things. 
how does one get really healthy and nice potted trees? I think it's good growth soil, every season is a better way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, you know, the soil is important. Um, I mix my own soil. Um, again, I think for me with 100 trees and giving away 25 and getting 25 new ones every year, I've always got to have a, a pretty constant supply of soil. So I mix my own soil. Um, again, there's another one. <laughs> you ask 100 different people what soil they use, you're going to get 100 different answers. Um, the, the, key, the key really is just porosity. You know, you, you don't want you don't want to grow in topsoil. You don't want to grow in mud or clay or sand. You know, I use pine bark. And if I can get peat moss, pine bark, some compost, um, it's kind of just a feel. And I can say that every year it's not the same. So it's whatever I can get my hands on when I'm when I'm making a batch of soil and the or media in the springtime to repot everything it's really what else what else, what can i get my hands on so i'm going to the i'm going mm -hmm. to the landscape supply and i'm getting some aged uh, pine bark um, maybe some compost and i'm mixing it with uh pine bark nugget nuggets from home depot like whatever whatever i can get my hands on but it does start with good good media something that's going going to uh, drain properly but also hold enough moisture for the plant. Then, so, you know, starting with a good media is really important. Um, outside of that, then, um, a lot of people, um, I think, struggle because um, of water um, variability, too dry, too wet. So if you get, if you get a good media and a good soil structure and it drains properly, um, don't let things dry out. Um, you're going to be pretty successful. Um, I think if you're trying to hand water things, you can't go on vacation. You know, you can't skip a watering. It gets hot. I think sometimes people fail just because they're dealing with variability, you know, and trees and figs don't like that. When you put them in a pot, they need to be constant. So if it was in the ground and it had taproot or it had roots that were, gathering moisture from the surrounding soil it can take some drought um but when you're in container culture it changes everything um a lot of times i think people confuse growing a tree in a pot versus the ground um they're two different things um you know and a lot of the recommendations that you hear can be a mixture of those two worlds and Sometimes people start saying things and don't even realize that person A is talking about something in the ground and person B is talking about it in the pot. And they're disagreeing, but they're talking about two different worlds. So, mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, getting the water right is going to be key. To me, that's, that's the key to the growth. Um, I've always – I'll hang my hat on that is that if you – you know, if you lose water and you, you kind of have drought-like conditions, your trees are going to stop growing, and they're also going to stop fruiting. Even if the fruit buds are there on the tree, it looks like everything's going to be go, uh, uh, you know, re ready to go, and everything's going to expand and swell. And then all of a sudden, you just have too much drought, too much lack of water, and you won't get the fruits you want. Um, so I think water is really that on or off switch is what I like to think about it, is uh, the on or off switch of growth. Um, and the, you know, obviously the, the food definitely can help, but, um, if you want to have a lot of growth, I think that fertile or that water is really the key. And of course you, you got to think about sunlight. So Dan, where do you, how much sunlight do you get in your yard? And I'm sure it's variable depending on where they're at. That's a good point too. I mean, um, I've got a few people that have told me, Hey, I'm not getting that many figs. Um, what am I doing wrong? You know, their plants look healthy, but um, I, I don't think they're getting enough sun. So mine, I've, I've placed mine so that, um, they're getting a good eight hours of sunlight a day. I think if, if you don't get enough sun, you're not going to get the fruit production that you think that you should. So, um, if you're trying to grow a fig on your back porch and it gets shaded from a, a, a maple tree and you're only getting four hours of sunlight, you're just not going to get the fruit production that you need. So... I, you know, I Dan, really it's don't. interesting because I, I just think. Sorry, were we gonna were we gonna finish with that? Um, no, I just you know you, you need to make sure that things that get as much sun as you can. You know, 
pick pick the mm-hmm. sunniest spot that you can. So um, I've had several people that yeah, then I come to me and just say, hey, you know, what am I doing wrong? I can't get this thing to fruit. I've had it for five years. It just won't set fruit. Um, if they're if they're not dealing with variability in water, sometimes it can be sun. Right. I think it's pretty spot on. It's a neat, it's a pretty simple way to put it. Cause if they have a healthy tree and they're not getting fruit, it's very likely just sun. Um, and here in my yard, I, I really don't get a lot of light. Um, which is, uh, really depressing because I've learned over the years, the importance of that light. And every year the trees get taller and taller that block the sun. And, and the sun, of course, at a certain time of the year, when the, 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 the trees are really fruiting, the sun gets lower and lower. So, uh, you know, even right now and really the middle of September this year, my patio, which has all the container trees on it, have, have no light. So in the spring, I'm able to set the fruit buds and get the trees to actually produce fruit. But the problem is they don't really have a whole lot of sun at a certain point when they're actually ripening. And so things get a little wonky and very difficult, and it, it's just not it's not great. And so... Uh, it also kind of lends the, to the point of like, well, you know, what variety is more productive than the other, right? This is a topic I think about a lot, and it would be totally a different answer depending on your yard, depending on where you lived. If you had a lack of sun like myself, well, only the figs that really can fruit well in that lower amount of light are going to actually produce well. And so if I moved somewhere and now I, all of a sudden I had – 11 hours a day of light or 12 hours a day, well, then I would probably have the majority of my fig trees producing really well. And it'd be really hard, I imagine, to differentiate between what varieties are really productive and which ones aren't, um, because they all would be relatively productive. So there's almost some benefits, in fact, of growing all these varieties in a, a lower amount of light to really determine uh, how productive I think they are. Because if you if you can define productivity by how many fruits you could produce in a given a given space. And let's take out weight out of the equation. If you have X amount of fruits in a given space, the variety that should produce the most amount of fruits is the variety that will fruit in the lowest amount of light because then you can have more fruiting branches and more branches, more leaves, more leaves is more fruit. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is when you have too many leaves and too many branches in lower amounts of light, you run the risk of actually not getting fruits at all. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting topic, the whole light thing, and it, it was a hard lesson for me to uh, to learn. Um, so light's a critical piece. What about, Dan, your your heat? How do you, Where do you stand with the temperatures? What, what can you teach people about that? Well, I'm in Zone 6B. Um, I don't use a greenhouse to start anything. I don't do a lot of shuffling. In the spring, I, again, when you're dealing with 100 trees and I'm busy at that time of year, I can't be moving things in and out. So um, when it's time to come out, they come out and they stay out. Uh, I think I think I might move them in once. I think I did that a couple of years ago because it got really uh, cool. Um, usually around April 1, you can kind of look at the 10 to 14 day forecast and kind of get a general feeling. But that's burned me a mm-hmm. few times. Um one time I just let it go, and the other time I did do the shuffle. Um, but generally speaking, in where we're at, by May 1st, you can be pretty much out of the frost. So, um, it, so that's, I mean, you could go, you could talk for a half an hour about this alone. Just, you know, when, when do you move your plants out? So, you know, they're stored in the garage. So, um, I mean, I, I get people that come by and say, well, where do you put all these things, like, in the garage? Like, how do you get them in the garage? Because my garage is not that big. Um, they stack up like a pyramid, and it's like a puzzle putting them in, and it's a puzzle getting them out. So there's no way I'm wanting to do a shuffle in and out. So um, if I'm lucky and we've had some really cool weathers, they don't break dormancy, and they're not growing. So if they're not growing, a frost isn't going to hurt them. Um, I'm actually hoping for a frost now because the frost is going to knock the leaves off and allow me to stack them away and put them away for the winter. The longer that lasts, the longer I, we don't get a frost, the worse I'm going to, the worse shape I'm going to be in because it's going to be crappy and I'm going to have to be doing this when it's 20, 30 degrees outside 
when it's miserable. But in the springtime, you know, I'm just kind of watching that weather and I'm hoping that the figs aren't breaking dormancy. If they do break dormancy, if we've had a really nice stretch of weather and they start breaking dormancy in the garage, then watching the weather is more important because if you move them out and they've broken dormancy, then you get a frost, then you're screwed. You got to move them in. Um, if they haven't broken dormancy, you can take them out. If you get a frost, it's not going to really hurt anything too too bad. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to get in the teens or in the twenties, but you can get into the low thirties and get a light frost, and it's not going to cause too much problem. Um, so. Um, I don't use any heat really in the garage at all in the winter time. If we get if we get into the negative temperature, I have a little space heater that I'll run in the garage. It doesn't do a whole lot. It just takes the bite out of the air. You know, um, having them in the garage away from the wind is a big part of it. Uh, they're frozen. They're frozen like blocks of ice. So um, it's you know the freezing in itself doesn't hurt them. Um, I water them two or three times in the winter time. Um, if they're frozen, I don't water them. You don't want to free. You don't want to water them if they're frozen. But, um, but yeah, I don't. I don't heat the garage, and and I'm just careful about when I bring them out in the spring. I don't know. Don't know if that answered your question or not. No, it it wasn't exactly what I was going for, but it did a, a very helpful information for everybody that's listening. Um, and I'm very curious about not just you, but other growers and how they approach this. Cause like you said, there's so many different things that you could, you could answer if you asked a hundred growers. So, uh, it's amazing what these little variations are between grower to grower and, and the reasons for what, why they do it. And, uh, it seems like there's never really a right or wrong answer. It's just maybe one person prefers this particular thing because of, like you said, you don't have a big garage. You got to stack them. I mean, there's so many reasons for. I, you know, I have well over a hundred potted trees at this current moment. Yeah, they're heavy. You know? Pretty big uh, pots, so, though. I mean, I, I physically, I mean, I'm not yep. old and I'm not young. It still hurts when I have to move a hundred trees around the next day. So, um, I have a, a big ball and burlap cart that I use. I borrow it from work and I bring it home and I, you know. It takes it takes all a, a good two or three days to move everything, put it in like a puzzle, and so yeah, yeah. It's it's actually kind of getting a little old. Uh, every year it, it goes on. I I think about why am I still doing this, and so that's a lot of the reason why I'm trying to grow as many of them as I can in the ground and keep the ones in containers really just for trialing purposes. So. As you know, there's a lot of varieties that exist and a lot of varieties that we've, you've trialed, I've trialed, we've gone through, we've looked at, I'm sure, thousands of photos of hundreds of different varieties and made decisions on, well, I like this one, I think this one's going to be good, let's maybe, this one I'm not really too interested in, but maybe somebody has a nice opinion on, and so there, you know, there's a lot of reasonings. What are, What is the... The main things that you look for in a fig? That's a great question. Um, and it changes. So when I first started off, I wanted the best tasting fruit. And I think kind of what I've seen you do is, is I want fruits that are going to hold up. Um, they're not going to split in the so rain. what exactly? The rain. Okay. Like we've been really lucky here this year. Um, we really haven't gotten any rain um, it's raining today, but um, October and September and October, we hardly got any rain. So um, most of my figs have not split. Um, but what I'm looking for is figs that will dry on the tree. The bugs won't bother. They don't split. They're productive and they're early. That's really what I'm looking for. Mm. So varieties like Detrace displays, um, the Mount Edna figs really do well. They they ripen early. Um I don't. I don't want to see two hundred figs on a on a tree and only taste three of them, because the cold weather comes and wow, that fig was great, but I only got one of them. You know, my mm -hmm. Portisat Negro Ramada. It's a great fig. It's a beautiful fig, but I've only tasted two figs off it this year. So I'm kind of trying to. I'm starting to think about. What fi what figs will ripen early? And by by now, I don't have any figs left on it. Detrace displaces one of those ones that 
it's it gives you a little bit of a breba crop, but it ripens in August and it's done now. There are no more figs on it. That's that's a true awesome fig. So uh, Smith, that's a great fig. Um, it gives you a ton of figs, and it's almost done now. So uh, in my first two years of collecting, I I gave that plant away to somebody. Um, oh, because I didn't think that it was going to be a good fig. And the guy was coming to pick it up, and one of them was ripe on the tree, and I ate it. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm, why am I giving this one away? <sighs> so he gave me a cutting back, and I, 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 I've never let it go since then. So that's the cool thing about he it. You, you, a you, can, you can get a cutting back. You know, they're not going anywhere. You know where you know who you gave them to. So... That Smith mm -hmm. is, is um, I got that one from Rafed. I grew it for a couple years. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be a dog, and it, it's it been one of the best ones, and I think everybody should have one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you I'm know, always looking for Dan, Those are the uh, ones I'm looking for. I You know, Dan, I said, well, you didn't mention the berry flavor, by the way. You did say that you want to have the best tasting ones, but you you typically go for the ones that taste like berries. I mean, you, yeah, I don't, stronger I don't berry really flavor, and I'm honey. surprised. So you like the sugar figs, though? Like the Trace Displace is more of a sugar fig to me, right? It's not. The, it um, it makes up for its lack of berry flavor by being a productive full season fig. So. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not a true berry flavor. Um, it's not. It's not a honey fig though either. So it's not like a Kadota or um, you know one of those uh, honey figs. I don't like melon and honey. Right. You don't like melon and honey. So Dan, I have this uh, this new flavor profile thing that I mean, I've always had one on my spreadsheet, but I recently added yeah, it to my I website and my blog. Yep. Okay. So one of the categories I really like now is um, it's called sugar honey. So they're really uh, a mix between honey and sugar figs. And I would really highly recommend that you and other people try to find a, a cup, one or two of these because uh, they're not really your classic honey fig. I find a lot of the classic honey figs are just, they're bad. I mean, my grandfather who grew up with figs and, you know, a lot of Italian old people that live around here in the Northeast, I... You know, I speak to them, and they tell me all about the honey figs, and those are their favorites, and they love them, and that's what they grew up with, and that's what they know. And then when I give them something, like I even gave this woman uh, across the street from my parents' place at, at, the, at the Jersey Shore, and uh, I gave her some little ruby figs, which are probably, in my mind, some of the most figgiest figs. They really have, like, the most amazing dried fruit flavor. Like, they're almost a raisin, it seems like. Um, and I gave her those, and she said they're the best-tasting figs she ever had. And uh, you could get the, of course, she grew up with these honey figs. And some of them, I unfortunately, like my grandfather, they still, my grandfather was over my my house this year. He lives in Florida and he's 90 years old. And he's telling me, he's like, Ross, you see this fig right here? You should sell this fig for a lot. I'm like, he's a businessman, <laughs> by the way. I'm like, well, why? I'm like, why do you think I should sell it for a lot? He's like, oh, it tastes the best. And guess what it was? Just a Dotato, just a Kidota fig. Uh, with uh -huh. a different name. And I'm like, you know, grandfather, uh, grandpa, everybody has that fig. Nobody likes it. Uh, I can't sell it for anything more. I can barely give it away. <laughs> so it's just funny what people will prefer. And I, I'm, a, I'm with you. I really like the sugar figs. I think they're underrated. Uh, of course, I'd rather have a Smith over a little Ruby. I'd rather have a Smith over a Detrace Displace. But uh, you know, these sugar figs, if they're productive and they produce a lot and they're reliable uh and it's different it's a totally different flavor profile so the sugar figs and the honey when you combine them two together especially something like barb alone um and another one that i have uh let's see what's the other one that i'm not thinking of here uh well you could say zafiro but um you know, I think really both of them, because Barb alone is, is really like a mutation, um, is what the word on the street was. You remember back on Figs for Fun, 
Pauly, 22, in, in uh, British Columbia, he used to talk all about Barbalone. He said it's so reliable and it produces a good Brava. And there really wasn't a ton of information on it other than it was just like a, a dark-skinned white Marseille or a dark-skinned Latarula. And so I never really paid too much attention to it and finally got myself some cuttings of it from, uh, I think, Byron, by the way, which is, if I don't know if you remember who Byron is, but oh, yeah, he's I remember uh, that doing really well with a new... He's doing really well with a new farm of his uh, somewhere in Oklahoma, I think, or uh, Kansas. I can't remember where he's at. But anyway, so he got that fig, and uh, I got it from him, and uh, it turned out to be really good. I was surprised. It's not just a white Marseille. There's really something a little extra to it. Um, I don't want to die by that sword. I'm not going to say, Dan, you're going to love Barbalone. You're going to love it. But I will definitely say you should. it's worth trying one of those in that. I really like Sweet Joy which is another one that Bass introduced uh, that I like in that profile. And it to me, it tastes like a cotton candy kind of fig with a, a spicier skin and, like, you know, more of an interesting sugar, uh, honey profile than just your typical Dotato or yellow long neck or some crap like that. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's interesting to hear you say all this. I'm, I'm surprised because these sugar figs, again, I, I just think they're underrated. Uh, that dried fruit flavor. Do you ever have a persimmon? Yeah. Yep. So that, I've got a, that persimmon I've got a flavor. Here, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's so there's a, a, there's I, a persimmon I grow. Rosianca's kind of like this dried fruit flavor, but even a little bit more is like this variety called proc. Yeah, uh, and Proc has a lot of that that dried fruit flavor that comes through, like a raisin, and so I really like the sugar figs for that reason. Unfortunately, a lot of them, like the classic ones that we think about, are things like Brunswick and California Brown Turkey, and some of these maybe uh, weaker Celestes, uh, Vern's Brown Turkey. I don't know, um, maybe even um, maybe even Osborne Prolific. These are figs that really people, or Eng English brown turkey, these are figs that people don't care about. They don't really have a great reputation. You know, they don't perform well in most places, as Celeste does. I'm really starting to like Osborne Prolific recently. But I've got one you can called, find um, one that performs well. I've got one called Femarn, Femarn, which is supposed mm -hmm. to be an English brown turkey. And... I know what you're saying. I mean, it's a great fig. There's nothing wrong with it. It's it's prolific. It doesn't split. It produces the whole season. Um, but yeah, I've sold a few plants and nobody really wants it. But I'm like, wow. okay, what's up with this? Because this is not a bad fig. Um, maybe people hear the word. I... It's like a English brown turkey, and they hear that word brown turkey, mm -hmm. and they're turned off. Maybe. But there's nothing wrong with it. I don't. I don't know what it is. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of um, you know a lot of hype that's involved with some of the varieties, and and um, you know there's a lot of crap that goes on with all that, and so people chase figs for the wrong reasons, you know. And you said it right then and there is that you know you've changed your mind and you used to go for the tastiest ones, and now you go for the ones that perform really well, and so there's a lot of value in that. I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear you say that a little bit because, uh, I think at Michigan, it doesn't rain as much here as it does here. Uh, but I could be wrong. How much, how many inches of rain do you think you every, get annually? What I've seen is every year is different. Um, normally what happens is we get most of our rain. We get most of our rain, um, from October all the way till May. And then July, August, September are pretty dry months here. Um, but, we're in, mm. you know, late September, October, it's, you get a lot of rain here. And so it really, it really hurts when you have, you have a great growing season, your trees are full of figs and they're just about ready to ripen. And then the rains come and it's like once a week, you're getting a downpour that causes everything that's close to ripe to split open, bust open, blow it up like a balloon and, the yellow jackets come in and eat everything. So this year we haven't really had that. So we have, we've had a really good year, but this has been a little bit of an anomaly because normally, normally we get some pretty good rain in September and in October that kind of ruins a mm. good 25% of the crop, maybe more. So they go to the chickens Sudan. or whatever. 
Yeah, Dan, you know, I I don't know if you've heard of me talk about or heard maybe someone else mention uh, something called the hang time. Yeah. So I also now I'm, I'm calling it the uh, susceptibility window because uh, every fig, as you know, takes a certain amount of time to ripen in that final ripening stage, right? There's, uh, of course, the amount of time it takes for it to set and swell to the right yeah. size. and then, But eventually it, it turns color and it gets larger and yeah. softer and uh, the sugars get in there. But every fig at that end, at the very end, takes a certain amount of time. And a lot of that's based on the heat, right? A lot of that's based yeah. on the metabolism the of the tree. And so if you're later in the season, the colder it gets. And so yeah. when you are now later in the season where most of your figs ripen and now it's starting to rain, well, now you're really having longer hang times. And and one of the things that I really have learned is the probably the most important thing um, for these varieties is, is that hang time is how long does it really take for it to hang on the tree before you pick it and you think it's perfect and you really get to enjoy it. And so that's my number one thing. My characteristic is, uh, is that, that hang time now, uh, because even with this, you know, where I'm at in the Philadelphia area, we're at the mercy of these hurricanes. Sometimes these nor these nor'easter storms that come in, yeah. It comes out from the Gulf and then goes up the coast and we just get dumped on for, you know, four or five day stretches of rain. And so uh, we actually have relatively after this hurricane season ends around October, we got a drier climate for a bit. Um, but at that time, it's just so cold and you can't really enjoy the figs that much. But I'll tell you what, if I go outside right now, variety like Smith is still pumping out pretty, pretty darn good figs. Why? Because the hang time is relatively short. It's not a, I wouldn't say it's average and I wouldn't say it's long. Uh, it's somewhere around in the, you know, the heat of the summer, it's probably around three or four, five days. And then now maybe it's somewhere around that same, that end of it, maybe five or six or seven days. But if you can get them even shorter, I mean, there's some varieties, Dan, like there's a fig I ripened this year called the one. It's a, it's just a Celeste, really. I mean, I've found, I've been really into these Celeste figs. I'm trying to get a lot of them. And, and so this particular one is a little bit different than the others in the sense that, at least so far, it ripens a lot quicker in that final ripening stage. Uh, it ripened within one or two days. So um, one day, let's say, it's not edible. Can't pick it. It's full of sap. Uh, a day and a half later, two days later, in the heat of my summer, it's dry, It's shriveled on the tree. Uh, which I found to be just insane. I've never seen that. Uh, there's other figs, um, like uh, Little Ruby has a shorter hang time. Uh, this new variety called Rissoulette, uh from Figus du Monde. Um, yeah, there's a couple of these, and, and so I'm really long spiel. Sorry, Dan, but um, yeah, I'm trying funny. to you know really. That's true. I mean, I've that's got the, the thing Felicia that I'm Nag looking at. Galicia Negra is loaded with figs right now, and they're all black, but they're hard. Like they won't soften. Mm -hmm. They all look good. And they're when they soften, there. and when they soften, Dan, to like even just a small amount, and they just sit there at that semi-hard stage, then the rain can just hit them and destroy them. Yeah. So it's like if they can at least just ripen quick, you would have a much better shot at actually getting a good fruit. Um. How about uh, one or two other varieties that people may uh, should know about? Oh, um, I've got one called Calderwood. I, I like that one. Um, I think it's an LSU Tiger. Mm -hmm. um, that you might mm -hmm. call like an improved Celeste maybe. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I've never grown an improved Celeste, but that one's one of my favorites. Um, it's not, it's not a, like a, heavily sought after fig but it's a reliable producer of really good tasting figs it's so. a great one seriously uh i've learned the value of lsu tiger this year and the chewy skin i wanted to tell you this that you've been like talking kind of about paper. for a few years yeah i yeah, did like not realize like but it's like man you want to eat that like you kind of crave the skin on that fig it's interesting it's a very different texture, right, from the pulp to the skin. And it's like two different entities, whereas some of them have just one uniform texture. And so you're right. The texture on LSU Tiger is unlike any other fig I've ever 
eaten in the skin in that it is very chewy, very different. And when it dries really well too, it's even better. It's, uh, mm -hmm. when it's a little less ripe, a little harder, it's not as good, but as it sweetens up, it's, uh, you're right. So Dan, um, before we let you go here, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about propagation because, uh, you know, you on your YouTube channel, you did put out some videos on propagation about, you know, tip rooting cuttings and, um, you know, you, you said you worked in a greenhouse, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Or you worked for, uh, so you've always been, uh, someone that I look at in terms of propagation and, and growing plants, uh, with your horticultural degree. So this tip rooting thing, we were talking a little bit before the, you know, the video started here, but, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the failures and successes you've had with that? Yeah, so I, I did that video a couple of years ago, and it, it kind of came out of the, the need to, you know, we were going around and, and I'm taking the tip cuttings, um, you know, trying to um, push more fruit um, around July, you know, late June, July, you know, you're, um, I think you've talked about it before where you take, um, you take the tip and you pinch the tip. Well, what do you do with all those tips? I hate throwing stuff away so i'm like well i wonder if i could root these so um i did that series on it with and i used the root riot cubes and the the uh, rock wall cubes and the rock wall they both worked really well um i did find that the later that i went into the season the less success i had so it almost seemed like um they had more energy or they rooted better the earlier I took them. So mid to late June ones rooted a lot better than mid to late July. So for whatever reason, it could be day length. There could be some day length sensitivity there. Uh, maybe maybe after you go past the uh, summer solstice and the days start getting shorter. I think the summer solstice is what, June 22nd, 21st. So there, there could be yeah. who knows what what's causing that um, air layers are the same thing you know you can send an air layer in june or early july and they do very well but you get into mid-july late july into august and they seem to take a considerable amount more time to fill out those root those air layer um but um but yeah so um, I used the root riot and on green cuttings and it worked, it worked fairly well. And, um, so then it, it made me feel good. I, you know, you're taking these tip cuttings and you're not just throwing them in the trash. You're actually able to, um, get something out of it. So, um, this last year I did it again and I used soil, just regular soil. And, um, like you were talking and, and I've had some people say this too, is they get a lot of mold. Um, I think you really got to watch your, your humidity and the airflow. Um, if you can crack those domes a little bit and get some airflow in there. And, um, um, I think having sterile media helps too. So the root, the root riot cubes or some sort of a sterile media is important. Um, because, uh, this last year when I did it with soil, I did get a lot of gray mold and a lot of rot. So, um, for whatever, for whatever that's worth. So. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about, Liz, we were talking about the when you root the uh, the cuttings later in the season versus earlier in the season, and I put on about 200 air layers this year, and uh, actually I've been doing this now for, this is the third year, I've probably put on over 100 every, uh, consecutive years uh, with the sandwich bag method, and so um, it works out pretty well, but I see much better success with uh, obviously different mediums, uh, but the more success I think I've had this year has been way above and beyond earlier in the season. Uh, and so the figs, they root um, way better early in the season. I, I thought it was about actually the level of lignification because uh, on a lot of these air layers, Dan, I'm, I'm doing them so quick in such high quantity because I, I don't score the bark. I eliminate that whole step because if I score the bark, it's going to be – sap everywhere it's annoying it's really burns my skin um oh, yeah. also it's an extra step it's it's just not it's a lot of t very time consuming to score a, a branch and so 
I thought, uh, well, let's try to eliminate it, and I'll put the the air layer on the top of the branch because on the top of the branch, that's where the growth is the uh, the least lignified. Now, if you if you put the air layer up too high, uh, and if the growth is not lignified at all, you can actually kind of kill the branch, and uh, that growth will die because it's too much moisture around that new growth. It doesn't happen all the time, but it can. And and then so when you when you put it at the right sweet spot. It seems like at least the, the the fig tree roots out really well, but I, you know, the more I put on and the later the season went, the less success I saw with that. Um, the at least uh, I had pretty good success with them across the board, but uh, it definitely seems like earlier in the season there is something going on there with the figs. So um, very interesting point there. Now. Is there anything, Dan, that uh, before I let you go here that, you know, you want to say or you think is important to share with other growers? We haven't already talked about something that you kind of want to pass on, um, maybe an important message, maybe something that's going on in the fig communities or, you know, wh- whatever it is, um, you know, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Not, not too much. Just, you know, I, I just encourage people to try to share with one another and, and enjoy it. Um, for what it is and um, share freely with each other and when you share freely with each other usually what will come back to you in a good way Um, that's all I can really say (laughs) all right (laughs) well that's that's nice I mean it's true Um, so Dan uh, if you have if you want to plug anything I know I talked about your YouTube channel but Dan also by the way guys he sells um, you know, a lot of plants throughout the year on FigBid, as well as I do, but he uh, has some really nice trees, nice varieties every single year. Typically has them earlier than I do. Uh, he's really great uh, a seller. So I highly recommend if you guys are interested, you want some trees from Dan, not right now, but at some point next year, he will definitely have some trees and maybe he'll start selling in the fall. We were talking a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, Dan, you um, want to plug anything else or? Yeah, I'll, I'll have cuttings. Um, I'll be taking cuttings here in another three or four weeks. I'll have cuttings on fig bed. Okay. And, um, yeah, I'll have plants again next year. So uh, usually around mid-April to May through through the summer into the fall. So. And what's your tag on uh, fig bed so people know that you're the seller? It's, honestly, I think it's D Foster 25 or just D Foster. So, and like yeah, you said, okay. I'm, I'm the guy with the pretty plates. I, I kind of look at, um, I kind of, <laughs> I, I kind of look at the presentation as art and I think figs are beautiful. Mm-hmm. And if I can display them in a beautiful way, then, um, that's kind of just, uh, another interest that I have. I just, it's, I don't do it for any sort of marketing or anything like that. I just, you know, I, I wanted to photograph and, um, document my journey and, the plates are kind of what I started with without the intention of ever selling plants. It just kind of came along. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan, I really appreciate the talk, your time, everything, all the stuff that you posted in the communities, all the stuff that you do for everybody. It's, it's uh, really, it's fantastic. So I want to thank everybody here for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit the subscribe button, Uh, check out Dan's stuff and also check out our blog, figboss.com. Catch you guys for the next one, all right? Take care.